Master, you said you were going to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, they would kill you. If that's true, then it's our duty to keep you from going. You must not allow it to happen. You're thinking as men think, not as God thinks. Welcome to Trinity 12. Well, wouldn't you? I think I would. I think I'd try and stop someone I loved going somewhere that would be harmful to them. Wouldn't you? Well, Peter did just that. Let's read it. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day he would be raised from the dead. But Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father and will judge all people according to their deeds. And I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not die before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Well, wouldn't you? I think I would have. Peter's insight on behalf of all those disciples uh, that Jesus was the Messiah marked a turning point in Jesus' approach. And he starts to share with them some more things. Now they've got the hang of that one, he can tell them some more things. The Messiah, he said, was not just for the Jewish nation, but for the world. Humanity has screwed it up. Jesus will sort it out. He references that shadowy figure in Isaiah, which we've spoken. Someone Isaiah calls a servant of God. That part of his work which includes suffering on behalf of humanity. You can read it in Isaiah 53. To take all the consequences of humanity's screw up into himself somehow and bring the story to a different conclusion. One of gloriously restored relationship with God and not alienation and defeat. Now, some have a problem with the fact that God has a problem with the world. And the way it treats people and the lack of respect it has for him and the damage it inflicts on itself through its constant selfishness. I don't have a problem with God's right to protest about how his creation has been hijacked and hurt. God has the absolute right to judge and we have no right at all to judge him. So this suffering servant in Isaiah stands forward to take the judgment on behalf of humanity. Now our Messiah 
is not an abstract concept or wishful thinking or even a hope on the horizon. He is a tangible person with a human body, a name, a history. He lived at an address. He ate with friends. He conversed with them as they tripped along the pathways around Galilee or from Jerusalem and past Jericho. And he had friends. And his best friend, John, wrote this. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This man, whose human body makes visible God himself, is preparing to take what humanity deserves, if only its pride would allow it to admit it. But it doesn't. If humanity doesn't want to be rescued, I, I thought, why on earth did Jesus bother to come? Isn't that an infringement of human rights? Well, it would be if this story was humanity-centred, but it isn't. It's God-centred. What he thinks matters more. His plan isn't just to rescue humanity, it is to restore Eden. So why couldn't he just flick a switch and restore Eden? Why go through that long process of growing a people from Abraham, of writing and living through centuries of Old Testament history, suffering an agonising death? Okay, issues in resurrection, but why go through all of that? There's some things we have to say that God is God. But my thought was this. What's to say it wouldn't happen all over again? Humanity's adolescent independence and disobedience to its own downfall. After all, God hasn't created a race of robots. Something needs to happen in history, this is just how I think, something needs to happen in history that becomes an external event, something so powerful that Eden can be restored safely and permanently, the relationship with God be free of guilt and shame and regret and consequence. So if Jesus dies, he takes it all into himself on the cross, an event that can never be unwritten, then Having cancelled those legal demands for justice, that we all need justice, he rises from the dead, the old is still nailed to the cross, the new is raised forever. But it isn't any surprise, is it, that his friends protest? Would, would you want your friend to go through so much? I don't believe Jesus was talking to Peter at all when he turns and says what he says. His arch enemy, Satan, was hissing in his ears as he did constantly trying to throw Jesus off track and prevent what would be a cataclysmic destruction of his power to enslave. Well, having won the battle yet again, Jesus says to you and me, to his disciples then, you want to fall in behind me? Live out the truth that you are on the cross with me. I took you there. You will also find yourself emerging from the tomb with me, resurrected. We don't go to the cross as Jesus did, of course. That was a once for all righteous for the unrighteous event. But we do acknowledge that the lives we live are free. Free lives with the threat of judgment gone, the label of guilt around our necks cut off, the fear of death vanished. We also live the truth that life is ours only. This life is ours only because Jesus won it for us and not cheaply. 
Grace is free, they say, but it is not cheap. Go anywhere you like to try and find this freedom and future, Jesus says. You'll be grasping at air and you'll lose all in the process. Find this freedom and future in the story and person of Jesus. Make it, it, the story and him, yours. That's life. Story that can be trusted. Person that is powerful. It's a powerful story. And it's a personal invitation to follow Jesus. But it is an extreme sport. Well, this might be a moment for you to pause and do your own reflection and say your own prayers. Here is love, fast as the ocean. special prayer for today. God of constant mercy, who sent your Son to save us, remind us of your goodness, increase your grace within us, that our thankfulness may grow through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.